Hi, my name is Scott Geib. I'm a research entomologist with USDA ARS in Hilo, Hawaii. And today I'll be talking about uh, using low input PacBio HiFi library prep and sequencing to generate high quality assemblies of non model pest arthropods. I'd like to thank PacBio and Diagenode for inviting me to speak on this topic and look forward to sharing our results. So, uh, Sequencing of our, of our pest insects is part of the Ag 100 Pest Initiative at USDA ARS. The goal is to produce annotated reference quality genome assemblies for the top U.S. arthropod agricultural pests and uh, some beneficial insects as well. USDA ARS, this, this, this is USDA ARS's commitment and contribution to the Earth Biogenome Project. And you can learn more about the Ag 100 Pest Initiative at the GitHub page below. The Ag 100 Pest Leadership Team uh, has an executive coordination team of Kevin Hackett, Anna Childers, and Brian Scheffler, as well as a core leadership group, uh, which are the leads of a variety of teams that uh, describe the different steps in the process, including prioritization, extraction, pre-sequencing, sequencing, assembly and analysis, and post-assembly. So we're selected the top pests from over 400 nominations across at least 10 orders. These nominations were gathered from USDA APHIS, a Federal Interagency Committee on In Invasive Terrestrial Animals and Pathogens, or ITAP, the CAP survey, uh, USDA researchers, and the Arthropod Genomics Community, or the I5K community. We've had diverse nominations, including pests of field crops, animals, bees, forests, and stored products. And nominations include some foreign pest species considered of high invasive threats to the US agriculture. And this is a very collaborative and community process. If you have um, uh, an agricultural pest insect that you have interest sequencing the genome and maybe don't have the capacity or the resources to do so, uh, please reach out to our group and we'll, we'll try to see how we can um, help, you, help you reach your goals. So the project, we have you know, these goals of generating uh, these high quality assemblies, but also we have many challenges. So how do you sequence every pest insect that's out there? Ideally, we'd like to follow sort of what other uh, groups are doing, such as uh, vertebrate groups or um, things like that, targeting chromosome scale diploid assemblies for these pest species. This requires multiple library types, things like generating a contact assembly from PAC bio sequencing, scaffolding information using things like HiC, BioNano, or linkage maps, and ensuring consensus accuracy reaching a QV of 40 uh, through either uh, polishing data or leveraging circular consensus reads uh, to generate accurate assemblies. Ideally, to create a true diploid assembly, you'd want to create all this data from the same individual uh, and, and avoid things like pooling of individuals or generating one set of data, for example, the pack bio from one individual and another set of data, for example, the high C from a different individual. Uh, when you start doing that, you start, to being, start being able to get into a, a case where you have to create pseudo haploid uh, reference uh, sort of um, assemblies that, that aren't really representing the, the diploid state of the organism. Uh, we're following EBP quality standards, shooting for things uh, at the 3.4.2 QV40 standard, which is a one megabase N50 contig and 10 megabase N50 scaffold and trying to get to chromosomal assignment with uh, several uh, data sources. I'll show you later that um, initially, you know, um, doing this was, was um, thought to be somewhat difficult, but with some of the advances in the hi-fi sequencing, um, we're easily being able to achieve these um, pretty, pretty well. Uh, but there are some limitations in our system. So we have uh, small physical size, limited DNA material for the various methods. So from if we want to try to get everything from one insect, we only have so much DNA that, that 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 insect generates. In some cases, it is tens of micrograms. In other cases, it's several micrograms, and in some cases, it's you know hundreds of nanograms or even less. Additionally, we're we're dealing with 
an extremely wide diversity of taxa, tissue types, sizes, things like that. Um, you'll, things like Lepidoptera are covered in scales. There's a lot of different developmental stages that might be more suitable for uh, um, extracting genomic DNA. Other samples are heavily chitinous, um, have a lot of cuticle, but very little tissue inside of them. So uh, coming up with ways to grind them, to um, extract things efficiently um, can, can uh, pose a threat. So everything is sort of its own, um, we have to approach everything independently, kind of come up with unique uh, solutions for each, each tax that we deal with. So the Vertebrate Genome Project provides a great framework that we're trying to follow for targeting these types of assemblies. So it, it includes things like generating PacBio long reads, uh, Illumina reads, uh, in this case, 10x genomics linked reads, bio nano maps, HiC data, and then um, RNA seq data, uh, in this case, coming from PacBio ISOSeq. And um, ideally, we'd like to follow this as closely as possible so that we can um, also generate very high quality assemblies. But there's some things we have to consider where they're using standard approaches and we're having to use a lot of low input approaches um, in our pipelines. So if this is your standard vertebrate genome or, or organism that you're, you're working to get a genome from, you can see there's a lot of different tissue types that you can get your sample from. There's no limitation of, of material. So if you uh, look at the, the vertebrate genome pipeline, you can get PacBio, 20 micrograms, easy, going into the library. Illumina reads, we'll get that from that part of the cow. Come to the back end to get your bio nano reads or bio, bio, bio nano uh, DNA to, to create gel plugs for, for optical mapping. High C data can come from a different part and RNA seq uh, as well. In our case, though, uh, we're not working with something the size of a cow, but rather maybe something like the little tiny flies that are that are a nuisance around the cows such as flesh flies or even uh ticks that might be feeding on the cow so this is a a tick that might be full of cow blood so how do we uh, reconstitute the genome of the tick while we avoid the cow uh, we might need to to uh, dissect off legs to, to avoid gut tissue or, or do dissections but starting with very 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 little material in some of these cases so in the past year or several years, there's been a lot of evolution of low input library preps. So there's been some changes towards improving low input samples. Um, a few of those things were going from the, the RS2 to the SQL and then from the SQL to the SQL2. So the big thing with the SQL2 system is you're able to get more reads from the same run. And with only a modest increase in loading mass, you can get a huge increase in read yields yield, which is important for samples with low input. So you might be loading maybe uh, three times the molar concentration on a, on a SQL 2 machine than what you might have been doing on a SQL 1, but you're able to generate maybe six or seven times the amount of data. So with samples with very little input, we're able to now achieve high enough coverage from a single lane that allows us to reconstitute the genome, uh, starting with essentially um, similar um, input amounts of DNA. Additionally, we're transitioning from CLR long reads to hi-fi uh, circular consensus reads. So CLR reads targeted the longest read possible. Uh, so when you're doing that, you're getting these really nice big long reads, but what it's doing also is lowering the sample molarity available for loading from the same amount of input DNA. Uh, so when you have long fragments, if you have 10 nanograms of long fragments versus 10 nanograms of short fragments, the molarity of those short fragments is going to be higher. Hi-Fi targer, targets these shorter fragments, thus higher, higher molar concentration from the same nanogram amounts of input sample. So for example, a 15 kb library versus a 45 kb library will be a three times higher uh, molar concentration. That allows you to then start with lower amounts of material again uh, and still achieving uh, high yields off the system. So while CLR has worked great in insects, there's nothing wrong with it. We've been able to show that one SQL2 run, we can get one genome. A good case of this is the spotted lanternfly, a 2.2 gigabase genome with a 1.58 megabase uh, N50 from a single uh, uh, lane or flow cell uh, of a SQL2 run. 
Uh, we started there with five micrograms of input DNA though. Uh, the DNA was not sheared and no size selection step was taken. So we didn't do any blue pip and high pass or things like that. By not size selecting the library, we were able to retain more DNA and thus have sufficient material for sequencing. Uh, our statistics on this uh, came out really nice. You can see more details in the paper, but um, we've, we've such, since taken this, this, this organism's very large, so we've been able to partition different regions of the, of the tissue to get different types, and, and now we're actually working on scaffolding this further with, with high C uh, to take it to, to chromosomal scale. But this uh, assembly um, had very, very high complement of, of the Busco genes and things like that, suggesting it was a good representation for this organism. Despite the fact that it works in some cases, there's still many shortfalls of CLR um, sequencing. So you do need a minimum probably of about 500 nanograms of DNA to make a library. Usually when you're starting specifically with 500 nanograms, only, there, only a sufficient amount of library will be made to run one smart cell, uh, which even with SQL2 output can be limiting for things with larger genome sizes. And if DNA has an integrity issue, if it's degraded, um, if, if maybe you have some high fragments and some small fragments, there's no necessarily high pass step to remove shorter DNA, which can impact the run output. So because we're only starting with 500 nanograms of DNA or a microgram, we're not able to, to run it through, through a, a blue pippin and still yield sufficient library uh, for running a, a, a smart cell. Um, so your, your choice is either to keep in the small stuff and lower the, the yield of that run or uh, work to, to um, find DNA of, of higher quality. So we're looking now towards hi-fi reads as an alternative. There's many um, things that favor them. There's shorter subreads allow, like I said earlier, lower nanograms amounts of library input for loading. So we can target smaller insects. We can target less starting DNA. The high accurate uh, CCS reads are required at a lower coverage to still generate a highly contiguous assembly. So we don't need as many CCS reads as we would um, CLR reads to create very high quality assemblies. An assembly of the hi-fi reads themselves can be very fast. So um, particularly in a large initiative like this where we're looking at doing you know, many assemblies a week, um, being able to do a hi-fi assembly in a few hours or in a day is advantageous over running um, uh, sequencing or, or assembly runs that, that might run for, for several days or a week. There are some caveats though. Uh, in order to generate those hi-fi reads, we need a, a method or a system for accurate shearing of low concentration DNA with little off-target fragments. And we need there's typically not sufficient library to allow for sizing of this, just like the, the CLR reads, um, if we create a shear of DNA that isn't tight around our target size, we're gonna have a lot of off-target fragments that are, are, are gonna be um, not ideal for the library. So um, to sort of maximize the hi-fi subread sub -read lengths uh, and and optimize the performance. We've, we've shown that Diaginode Megaruptor generates consistent shear profiles across DNA concentrations and qualities. So as long as you have a pretty good DNA sample, um, it could be probably 30 or 40 KB or larger, up to hundreds of KB in size. Um, we've been able to consistently shear DNA at our target size range, uh, regardless of the concentration that we load into the machine. So what we're trying to do here is generate as many um, subreads uh, in the HiFi library that are of the same size and maximize the length of those subreads to the point where we can reach a high HiFi read accuracy. So you can't make them so long that you don't get enough um, rounds of the circular consensus sequencing to, to get highly accurate reads, but you also don't want them to be short where you're just getting a 3 KB read or something like that. Uh, that's going to um, occupy the smart cell, but generate very little um, um, unique molecule uh, data. So we found that targeting between 12 up to maybe 18 or 19 KB has yielded um, very high efficiency of generating these, these um, hi-fi reads. We probably started 
between the 10 and 15 range, and now we've moved much closer to the 20 kb range and feel comfortable uh, that we're keeping enough reads in the, in the sweet spot that we're getting good um, outputs from the, the SQL system. So this is um, what a shearing profile would look like of a pretty, pretty good, good uh, sample. You can see here the, the mean is around 16.7 uh, uh, kb, and you see everything's pretty tight uh, between um, the size range that we're, we're targeting. So you don't see a lot of shouldering. In contrast, uh, this is just run on a, a fragment analyzer instead of a, a tape station, but here this is 17.5 kb. So also the size is, is pretty good, but you start to see a little bit of shouldering. I think this sample also uh, would, would run fine. Um, there's some steps we can use to remove this small stuff. Um, but that's probably indicative of some, some minor degradation of the DNA prior to shearing. Um, in contrast, you can see here the sample is probably oversheared. It's only 9 kb in size, or at least the mean. Uh, and you see a, a predominant um, lower shoulder. And so this is the type of sample that you wouldn't run a, want to run. And in this case, it was a sample where the DNA quality was, was uh, much lower than what we, we anticipated. And so here you might have some reads, you know, in that 10 to 15 kb range, but you're going to get swamped out by a lot of these smaller reads and just not get a good run. Um, the other types of profiles we kind of see are these very broad profiles um, where, where the peak kind of tails off slowly on the sides. Again, a sign of some degradation of, of the DNA. Um, but we find when we go into uh, the shearing step with, with high quality DNA, uh, we, we tend to get uh, more like what I showed you on the first slide with these very tight uh, shearing profiles, um, pretty targeted to where we're um, setting the shearing to be. So this is just kind of the steps going from genomic DNA. Here you can see almost everything's higher than uh, the higher peak on our, on our tape station, um, screen tape. Uh, the shearing, this is that 17.5 kb uh, sample uh, with a little bit of shouldering at the 3 kb side. And then the final library here actually ended up a little bit higher because we were able to, to remove a lot of that shoulder um, using uh, an ampere cleanup uh, that cuts around three or four KB, getting rid of um, anything smaller than that. And it really ends up going a little bit higher than that. So we ended up with 19.4 KB on our final library um, based off of the, the profile in the fragment analyzer. So if we sequence something like that, uh, we get some pretty good results. Um, this is a run where, let's look at this, the second line here, where we got 259 gigabases of unique, or of um, raw data coming off the sequencer. When you run that through CCS, um, you're really looking at a unique molecule yield of around 49 gigabases. But still, for a genome that's a one gig in size, that's 50x coverage. A genome that's 500 megabases in size, that's 100x coverage. And you can see we really reflect, so we were saying around 19, KB for that subread off the profile of the fragment analyzer. And that's almost exactly what we get um, in terms of the N50 of the subread links off the sequencer, uh, with the polymerase links being you know, almost 10 times that, uh, giving uh, plenty of, um, of cycles around the, the, the subread to properly, properly correct it uh, using CCS. So I'm going to give you some successes that we had um, using HiFi um, data on a variety of um, types of insect pests. Uh, this first example is the Indian meal moth. It's a stored grain pest. This is the webbing of an Indian meal moth here on infested stored products. Not something you want to see. The one thing I want to just point out is this is assumed to have 30 autosomes and, and, uh, one, um, and then the sex chromosomes. So our uh, shear, this is one of our earlier samples where we were targeting below 15 kb when we were still trying out the HiFi process. So we have a shear of around 13.2 uh, kb, or 13.5 kb shear. Uh, the, the reads coming off of that, the subreads was 12.8 kb, so pretty close to that, uh, yielding uh, 450, 444 uh, gigabases of total sequence output. Uh, which is 52 uh, gigabases of unique molecule yield. So unique CCS data in coming out of the run. Uh, and the polymerase, again, uh, about over 10 times as long as the subread length. So uh, we assemble that data, uh, in this case using HiFi Assembler, HiFi ASM. 
Um, remember I said this has 30 autosomes, or it's thought to have 30 um, autosomal chromosomes. Uh, if you look at the contig N50, there's only 14 contigs with an N50 of almost nine megabases. And at an N90 or L90, we're in only 35 pieces with an N50 of 3.5 megabases. So with having 30 chromosomes and only having 35 pieces uh, representing 90% of the genome, uh, many of these contigs are likely to be chromosomal length. So um, again, also, uh, 99.74% of the genome is, is represented in 61 contigs. So very, very um, highly contiguous assembly here. Uh, we took some um, Hi-C data generated using the ARIMA uh, Hi-C kits and overlaid that onto the um, Hi-Fi assembly. And what you can see, so any place where you see yellow lines here is where there's breaks and contigs. Um, uh, between, within chromosomes, but otherwise, if you see no yellow lines or yellowish green, I guess, um, these are single chromosomes that are contained, containing only a single contig. And we look at these and we see um, both um, centromere as well as telomere um, um, uh, sequence um, within these contigs. And so it's doing a really good job of, of just driving through that. And that was with the N50 subread of only 13.5 uh, KB. So really um, successful assembly. And you can also look at the high C data within chromosomes and just showing that those contacts follow right along with what the, the contig assembly um, suggested the, the, was the correct path through the genome. Additionally, uh, we looked at uh, these diarabda beetles, these are um, actually a biocontrol agent used in the out west for um, eating uh, weeds. So weed biocontrol in, in pasture land and range land and things like that. And what we wanted to do there, there were four species that were, were suggested by, by the group. Um, we wanted to see what type of consistency we get when we just process four samples that are very similar all, all um, at the same time. So there are these beetles. They're kind of marginal in size. They're not the smallest thing out there. And so we were able to start with several micrograms of DNA going in. So not um, the lowest of low inputs, but um, a nice test. And um, across the board, across the, the four species, we, we achieved very high um, assembly metrics. Um, these first two, I'm presenting Hi-Fi ASM uh, assemblies, the last two, high canoe there's some little differences there, but you know, contig in 50s with 22 uh, megabases, 23 megabases, um, and, and you know, 90% of the genome and only a, a few dozen pieces. Um, so this was very promising that you know, if we were to apply this just to a large group and just rinse and repeat and keep chugging along, um, we, could, we could repeatedly generate these high quality assemblies across simpler sample types. Uh, so after our success with those beetles, we said, okay, now let's go to our tiny beetles. So we've had a lot of people, especially in the stored grain pests, um, suggest uh, targeting these, these pest beetles. A lot of these are smaller than a millimeter uh, in length or, or several millimeters. One of them, the copper beetle, is one of the, the highest uh, threat pests facing uh, the US, uh, particularly in stored products. Um, additionally, we have the cigarette beetle. You can see how tiny they are against a ruler here. Um, and then a, a tribolium. Um, so uh, we did tribolium confusum, which is only a few millimeters long. So each of these uh, has a relatively low DNA yield, less than 200 nanograms. But they also have relatively small genome sizes, so between two and 400 megabases. So if we generate, we can have no problem generating, shearing down, getting good fragment lengths, uh, generating a hi-fi library, but we sometimes come to a point where we don't have the molar loading concentration needed to run an entire cell. So what we've uh, done instead is barcoded multiple libraries onto a single cell. Um, and this has allowed us to uh, run not only multiple species in one run, which lowers cost, but also allow us to meet the molar loading concentrations needed for these extremely small insects. So you might say, well, 
but maybe I'm not getting enough data for these things, you know, even at 400 megabases, you know, am I going to get the coverage needed to generate a, a, a good assembly? So for the three beetles here, the copper, tribolium, and cigarette beetles, uh, this is HiFi ASM assembly results. Um, our N50s are uh, nine megabase, uh, 14 megabase, and six megabase, um, with you know, most of the genome contained in 34, in this case, 66 and 52 pieces. So it's very likely that some of these are, are chromosome length contigs, um, and there's some um, high C data being generated um, behind these to kind of uh, look at scaffolding these to chromosome. One of the caveats of the high C data, though, is these are small enough where we're not able to, at least with what approaches we're using now and, and what we've tried, um, generate the high C data from the same individual that we're generating the um, hi fi data from. That being said, though, there are some cases where you might be able to do that. So low input data allows potentially multiple technologies from the same individual. So we go back to our cow where we can do anything we want because we have so much tissue, we can, you know, just keep going from that and trying something new and go back to the same cow. If we transform that cow instead into a, a fly, um, if you think of something about the size of a house fly, uh, maybe a little bit smaller, this is kind of where we're at now, where we're looking at generating the PacBio HiFi library using the low input methods from the head, generating the high c library from the thorax, and then saving the abdomen and, and seeing how it'll work on BioNano if we're able to gener generate uh, sufficient DNA. There's even possibility of pooling multiple individuals into one BioNano run um, and letting the sort of system uh, sort it out later uh, when you're dealing with these high quality assemblies. So a head-only HiFi library has yielded a contig N50 higher than uh, an older CLR data set prepared from the entire specimen of the same species. So from the whole thing, we can maybe get four micrograms. We did some CLR sequencing, uh, got a, a pretty good assembly with a, a several megabase N50. But then when we use the same uh, type of uh, critter, instead targeting the head only, generating a high five library, um, we're getting N50s, you know, um, uh, an order of magnitude higher. We're currently processing uh, thorax-only high c data that's paired with this, this HiFi library above. So we don't have data to present on that now. Um, the, the sequence data came back, but the, the assembly is still running. But what this does is when you look back at the vertebrate genome project, and we never really thought we could sort of, um, us, the little bug people, could sort of um, take some of the same approaches that they're using, at least in context to doing um, diploid assemblies. I think that now we can say, at least in some cases, you know, if it's an insect, you can get multiple micrograms from. Uh, little bugs too can be considered for, for generating this. So generating both PAC bio, high C data, maybe some other data uh, from the same individual and, and generating truly diploid um, chromosome scale assemblies uh, from a single individual. So essentially, with any insect generating more than 200 nanograms of DNA, I think you can generate high quality HiFi data. Um, depending on the genome size of that organism will we'll depend if that's sufficient for a, a high quality uh, assembly. Using these low input approaches though, new single insect assemblies can also be routinely made of wound true diploid assembly. So if you have an insect you can get five micrograms from, just take three or four nanograms three or 400 nanograms of DNA from it to make your HiFi data and save the rest for trying um, other approaches that will complement that HiFi data, like HiC, like um, uh, other scaffolding techniques. And even in insects with higher yield, so by partitioning tissue off for different techniques types, high quality chromosome scale assemblies, hybrid assemblies can be generated. And shearing has once, once again become very important to generate tight, reproducible sharing profiles to allow this high quality sequencing from these low input samples. So I will say if your shear is not um, consistent and within the range that you need, if you have a lot of shouldering on the side, you're gonna get a lot of your reads um, um, coming from smaller fragments or they're gonna be so long that they potentially might not uh, pass um, CCS quality filtering uh, for downstream use. So it's critical that you um, have a, a shearing approach that can generate these tight fragment profiles. 
So with that, I just want to uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk uh, and point out the sequencing cores for the Clay Center uh, ARS Lab in Nebraska, the Stoneville ARS Center in uh, Mississippi, uh, headed by Tim S Smith and Brian Scheffler. We have project champions, so there's different people who, who request and support and um, help uh, achieve assemblies across all these groups. For stored pests, uh, it's Aaron, Brenda, and Sue Brown, uh, the weed biocontrol group, uh, the pest fly group, myself and, and Shenna Semin Hilo. And I didn't talk about the squash bug today, but we also have a, a that's a rather large genome uh, that we generated a hi-fi assembly um, that was successful with um, Joseph Ringbauer and, and David Stanley in, in Columbia, Missouri. Extraction and library preps were made in uh, Hilo, Hawaii by my, my staff. Uh, and then we have our, our Ag 100 Pest Assembly Team, uh, which helps with the bioinformatics of a long group of people who um, are, are constantly working to, to move these forward. So if you have any questions or comments, please email me at my email here below and uh, visit our GitHub page to learn more about the Ag 100 Pest Project. Thanks.